Welcome, everybody. So for those of you that uh, in the U.S. celebrating Thanksgiving, happy Thanksgiving as we uh, end up on that weekend. And what I wanted to do before we get back into school is just to take a little time uh, to um, go over a quiz that I gave right before Thanksgiving break in trigonometry. And what we're going to do is I'm actually live streaming this to uh, Facebook, uh, my free math videos page, as well as YouTube. So I'll be taking a look at the comments as well, um, from both channels. So if you do have any kind of questions or any Anything that I'm covering in this quiz or that uh, you would like me to maybe cover after the live stream. I am doing something a little bit different. I didn't schedule this one and I just decided, well, you know, I have a little extra time on this Sunday, so I'm going to go ahead and just do a live stream. Um, so I'm not sure though. I have the kids and everything else. So I'm not sure how long uh, the live stream will be able to go, but I might be able to add in some questions at the end. We'll just kind of see how long this goes. So Please feel free just to you know, add in some questions and we'll, we will have a couple breaks here. Um, what I'm gonna do is work through uh, four free response questions, as you guys can see here. Just really everything that is dealing with um, our trigonometric functions go all the way up to the unit circle. And then what we'll do is we will cover um, the uh, five, um, five more, the multiple choice questions. And so what I'll do is I'll take a break when we go from free response to multiple choice, answer any questions I can, uh, check in with you guys. And then also at the end of the live stream or at the end after covering the quiz, I'll uh, go from there. But I'm, you know, for those of you that kind of enter, haven't been to my live streams before, I just kind of like focus on getting like each section done. Um, so I will kind of monitor the chat obviously to uh, say hi to you guys and see who's there. But I just want to make sure I can, you know, for my students that are going to be following up on this, that they can kind of quickly get to their answer. So anyways, I appreciate you guys joining here on this uh, on the Sunday evening. And what I'm going to do is get started here into trigonometry. So again, guys, this is also a quiz. So even though I'll try to do my best to like explain where everything is coming from or why I'm doing so much, you know, this is already stuff that's already been kind of discussed in class. So I'm not going to be doing it from a uh, basics kind of standpoint, just kind of more of like more of a refresher standpoint. So if you do obviously need a little bit more instruction, you know, the videos that I did up to this point um, in trigonometry would be helpful for you. So uh, the first question here is asking us to evaluate the six trigonometric functions given the right triangle and so the right triangle is we have the we have two sides we have two and we have four and you can see here we have right triangle and therefore we're missing a side and we can call the side anything we want to let's go ahead and just call it a all right um and then our angle here is x so it's important for us to understand what is the relationship of a two and four remember that four is going to be the hypotenuse um, a is going to represent our adjacent side because it's between the 90 degree angle and the um and our angle and then, uh, and then two is going to be our opposite. So from here, we can go ahead and apply Pythagorean theorem. So we can say one leg, the opposite side, plus the other leg, the adjacent side, both squared, adding them up, is equal to going to be the hypotenuse squared. And what I get here is four plus a squared equals 16, subtract four, subtract four, and then a squared is going to equal 12, so therefore, take the square root on both sides. A is going to equal the square root of 12, but we can simplify that further to be A is going to equal uh, two square root of three. And I did mention to evaluate and simplify. So therefore, that's any radical or fractions, we're gonna wanna simplify that. Um, now, the next thing that we wanna make sure as we cover is, again, this is just a triangle, right? So we're just measuring all these lengths of the triangle. So it doesn't make sense for us to include the plus or minus here. It's just always going to be positive values. Um, now we're just gonna evaluate the six trigonometric functions. I always like to start with the sine, um, sine, cosine, tangent. And again, if you don't remember those, I'm not gonna rewrite them because that's something that we've already done multiple times. So I'm just gonna use the Sokotoa just to, so just kind of a reference. So when you hear me say sine opposite over hypotenuse, then you know, oh, okay, cosine adjacent over hypotenuse, got it. Tangent opposite over adjacent. So let's talk about the sine of X because that is our angle that we are referring to. It's the sine of X. So that's going to be the opposite over the hypotenuse. So I'll write the original form, the original ratio I should say, and then the simplified version. The cosine of X, is going to be our adjacent side, which is now going to be two radical three. So that will be two radical three over four. And then again, that can simplify to the square root of three over two. And then we have the tangent of X. 
which is going to be opposite over adjacent. So that's going to be two over two radical three. The twos will divide out and we're left with one over the square root of three. And I've done plenty of examples in my class showing the rationalizing the radical. So that's going to leave us with the square root of three over three when you just multiply the top and bottom by the square root of three of three. Um, so the next one is just going to be our reciprocal functions. So the cosecant of x, um, even though that is just hypotenuse over opposite, it's just easier to take the reciprocal of our of the sine function, which would be two over one, which is just going to be two. For the secant of x, um, I I'll just go ahead and rewrite it with that reciprocal. So I'd have two over the square root of three. And when I rationalize the denominator, I get two radical three over three. And then I have the cotangent of x, which I'll just go ahead and take this reciprocal here. So that'd be two square root of three over two. And those divide out and we're just left with the square root of three. So those are the answer choices, uh, or those are the answers that we are looking for uh, in this first question. Now the second question is very similar, but it's different because the main thing that is different is I'm asking the same thing, but the important thing is now we have a constraint, meaning we just don't have a triangle that's in space. We now have a triangle that has you know some direction on its lengths of the triangle. So what we need to do is we need to draw a triangle where cotangent is less than zero. Now understanding cotangent, as a reciprocal of tangent or which would be adjacent over opposite doesn't really help us understand when it's going to be negative. That's why when we looked at the, um, when we looked at constraints, we looked at the, another way to look at this was in terms of our X and Y coordinates. So let's go ahead and just look at a quick little triangle. Cotangent is going to be less than zero. So if we looked at a triangle and we kind of thought about this as a point, then this would be like a y value and that would be a negative x value. So this coordinate point here will be negative x, y. Like if you think about going to the left, then that side is now negative if we're on an x and a y axis, right? So let's pretend we have this triangle here. Well, the cotangent would be adjacent over opposite, which would be a negative. Now, what other quadrants could we have where it's going to be a negative, um, a negative cotangent? And the other example would be in the fourth quadrant. And again, the only, if you remember these triangles, this would be a positive X, but this is a negative Y. All right, so now what we need to do though is determine like which triangle is correct because cotangent is negative either in the second as well as in the fourth quadrant. But out of those two, which one is going to be the correct triangle? Well, remember sine, um, you know, we looked at a lot of different uh, representations here. Sine could be opposite over hypotenuse. We also represent it as sine over y over r, where r represents the hypotenuse. And you can see that this that one makes sense. If we had y over r, then 5 over 6. Like that makes sense. It doesn't make sense down here because 5, you can't have a 5 there. That's positive. It needs to be a negative. It would have to be a negative 5. So therefore, this triangle does not work. This is the only triangle that's going to work. And what's important about that is this triangle is in the second quadrant. So I'm going to write five and six over here. And what that means is this negative value or this X value, this adjacent side, because here is our angle. Our angle is always the central angle. Our angle is now going to be negative. Let's kind of cross that in there. Um, so let's go ahead and use the Pythagorean theorem to figure that one out. So again, we'll call this A. So I'll do, I'll just call that a for right now. So a squared plus five squared equals six squared. And I'm oh, sorry, I have a button. So we have a squared uh, plus 25 equals 36. And then I subtract 25 on both sides. A squared equals 11. I can't do anything with this. But again, now when you're taking the like the, when you're taking the square root, you have to include the plus or minus, right? I didn't even bother doing it over here because plus or minus didn't really make any sense. But now plus or minus does make some sense because you can see that if it's going to the right, it's positive. If it's going to the left, it's negative. So therefore, our a in this case is equal to a negative square root of 11. And this would probably the number one mistake that I saw in the quiz when grading them is students not understanding the constraint, not understanding that it does it goes away from a triangle just in space to now a triangle in the coordinate system and understanding that the side lengths at, you know, can be negative or positive based on which quadrant. And therefore you have to understand these constraints to determine where the quadrant is. 
But then once students got to, once students, even if they left this as positive, you know, they were able to usually do the trigonometric functions, you know, not too bad because they, you know, remember them roughly from, we did a lot of examples in class. So now my angle is theta. So I'm going to say sine of theta and I can just say opposite of hypotenuse. We already have that one. So that was an easy choice. Everybody should have got that one, right? Maybe, <laughs> hopefully. Um, cosine of theta, that's going to be adjacent over hypot or hypotenuse. So that's negative square root of 11 over six. And the nice thing about this one was, you know, the big mistake was the negative, but there wasn't too much simplifying you needed to do. Um, you know, five negative square root of 11. You can put the negative anywhere you want to. Rationalize the denominator negative square root of 11 over 11. And that was really it. There was one problem where it was rationalizing the denominator and that was about it. Um, let's go and look at the trigonometric functions. So here I have cosecant of theta is just the reciprocal. So that's six over five. The secant of theta is going to be a negative six over the square root of 11. And then I rationalize the denominator. And then I have the cotangent of theta is just going to be a negative square root of 11 over five. All right, um, so now we kind of move away from the triangles and now we start to get into the angles in trigonometry that we talked about. And so I kind of just like threw a whole bunch of things that we talked about in class to have students kind of remember uh, or to provide you know, on this example. So first thing we wanna do is convert from, oops, convert from two, two degrees. Uh, find the reference angle in radians and find one positive and one negative coterminal angle in radians. I didn't clarify I wanted the smallest angle, um, but you know I was able to, most students were able to do it. The one important thing what a lot of students did is, you know, I asked for them to convert in degrees for the first part, and then they provided answers in degrees for the rest of the parts, which is very careful because everything, the problem is given in radians, so we want to make sure we answer every other question in radians, except for this first question, which was basically, um, you know, converting degrees. Another mistake that, another little minor thing that a lot of students did is they didn't label their work, and that was something that, you know, when you're doing multiple steps, you got to make sure that you are providing, you know, all of these were angles, right? Angle, 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 angle. So you got to make sure you're differentiating that or make sure you're representing that um, so I can understand. So part A, um, basically, guys, what we talked about was the conversion ratio, which was to get rid of the pi, we want to multiply by 180 degrees over pi because 180 degrees is equivalent to pi. They're just different units of measure. So now I can simplify this. The pi's would divide out. Six goes into 150 30 times. That's negative five times 30 degrees, and that gives you a negative 150 degrees. A lot of people left off the negative. Be careful about that. Um, for part B, we wanted to find the reference angle. And I think the easiest way to find the reference angle here is, you know, a lot of students, you know, you can graph it. There's formulas for this and that's fine. I just don't really prefer to follow the formulas because, you know, I look at halfway around a circle is pi, right? In the negative direction. If you're at five pi over six, so you're like right there, right? So then how far are you away from the x-axis? Because that's the reference angle. That is what we are looking for. How far are you away? And so that is your theta prime, which in this case is just going to be pi over six. So that is um, negative five pi over six. Okay, so my theta prime, which I didn't write in there, is going to be theta prime is equal to pi over six. And remember the reference angle is the uh, smallest positive, or I'm sorry, the positive acute angle between the terminal side and the x-axis. And then part C, um, basically what we wanted to do for part C was find coterminal angles. Coterminal angles are angles that have the same initial as well as terminal side. So the easy way to find coterminal angles is just to take your angle and then add two pi to it, or to take your angle and then subtract two pi. Two, two. So you can either go either either way. Um, sometimes you need to do multiple additions or subtractions of two pi, um, but I think for both of these, I left it pretty simple. So um, if you just kind of remembered what we practice in class, then that you needed to add and subtract two pi. So in this case, um, actually I forgot to mention, that's theta equals, theta equals. So rather than writing this as two pi though, 
we want to write this in terms of our denominator. Since we have a six, I'm not going to write this as two pi with the, just two. I'm going to write this as 12 pi over six because 12 over six is the same thing as two pi. So therefore, um, I'll just go ahead and write my coterminal angles. Therefore, are going to equal, let's see if I add negative five plus seven, that's going to give me a seven pi over six. And then I'd also get um, a negative five pi minus, that'd be a negative 17 pi over six. So by adding and subtracting, um, I would get those two angles and that would be my negative as well as another positive version. So moving on to the next one, this five pi over three. Um, again, let's just kind of like sketch it so we have an idea. Oh, again, you guys see how that works like negative 150? Like it makes sense. Five pi over three is going to be in the positive direction. So right there is three pi over three. So if I need to get to five pi over three, well, I know all the way around is six pi over three. That just means I am going to be a pi over three short. So that's what my angle would be. So I automatically know when I'm converting this to degrees, I know this is gonna be between like 270 as well as 360. But let's just go ahead and do the work here and figure out what it is. So theta equals five pi, oops, five pi over three times 180 over pi. Obviously the three is going to go into 180 60 times. Um, pi's divide out, five times 60 is going to equal 300. And you can see that makes sense as far as our angle in degree form. Um, to look at our reference angle, again, we're just looking for how far is it away from the x-axis. And again, our angle is five pi over three, all the way around the circle is six pi over three. So therefore we can see the reference angle is just going to be pi over three. And then the last part is again, adding and subtracting two pi, but rather than adding it as 12 pi over six, I'm gonna wanna add it in terms of two pi um, with a denominator of three. So I'm gonna take my angle as far as theta equals five pi over three, and I'm going to add and subtract two pi in terms of thirds, which would be six pi over three. And therefore I am going to get uh, 11 pi over three. And when I subtract, I'd also get a negative pi over three. So those would be two coterminal angles. There's multiple different variations, right? Because you could continue adding two pi or subtracting two pi as many times as you can or as you need to. Um, so I had to look out for those answers. But I don't think any of my students were, uh, were messing with me. So thank you very much uh, for not messing with me because, you know, technically I didn't clarify how I wanted those coterminal angles. So you could have gave me some pretty r random answers and I would have had to accept it. But I don't think I remember how to check those. All right, so on the last question for the free response was talking a little bit um, about our angles and referring to the unit circle. So what we need to do is sketch the angle in standard form, which I kind of did some practice over here. And then we talked about the unit circle as far as to evaluate. And a lot of students had trouble with the evaluate portion of that. And you know, that just comes into the unit circle. I, I didn't provide the unit circle for the students. We only spent a day kind of going over it. So I knew it was going to be um, you know, very fresh for a lot of students and they probably weren't going to remember it. Um, oops, hey, other way, sorry. Uh, weren't gonna remember it very well. So I kind of gave them some techniques in class to like hopefully last second uh, opportunities to like remember these kind of things. Um, but again, I'll just kind of, I'm not too concerned about it, at least right now, because I know, you know, by the time we get to our test, we will have done so many unit circle problems or problems involving the unit circle, I should say, that they will be very familiar with all these coordinate points. So again, right guys, just remember that this is the first quadrant, okay? Um, and these coordinate points here is zero comma one. This point is one half comma square root of three over two. This point is square root of two over two comma square root of two over two. And this point is square root of three over two comma one half. And what I kind of showed them was they all have the denominators two, and then you could do like square root of one, square root of two, square root of three, square root of one, square root of two, square root of three. And this point is one comma zero. Okay. Um, so again, the other thing to kind of remember that we talked about, and I'll just kind of write this in there. We looked at that on the unit circle because when we're looking at the 
triangles. We talked about the trigonometric functions, you know, with SOHCAHTOA, like opposite over hypotenuse, adjacent over hypotenuse, and opposite over adjacent. And then we started talking about the triangle in a on a coordinate grid where we started talking about X and Y coordinates so we could talk about constraints and then talking about R as your hypotenuse. So we came up with some new definitions as like X over R, Y over R, or um, you know X over Y as far as terms of like tangent. And then we looked at the unit circle and what was helpful for us is when we looked at the unit circle, then we could figure out that our trigonometric functions could be actually simplified. So for an angle theta, um, we could just represent that as y when it's given a point on the unit circle. So that was the important thing that we need to make sure that we remember. So cosine of theta here is going to equal just the x coordinate of a point on the unit circle, and tangent of theta would be a coordinate point of y over x. Sorry, I should say. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is basically identify where this point is, sketch the angle. So obviously this is a negative, so it's going in the negative direction. It's gonna go pi over six. So again, if we know that halfway around the circle is six pi over six, right? It's pi, so it's six pi over six. Well, if I'm just gonna go over one sixth, I'll break this up because um, I guess we're still kind of learning the unit circle or sketching. So that means we need to break up pi into six parts and then we can see that our angle here, I'll do that in purple is going to be pi over six. So you can see that is where the angle would be. Make sure that you have the initial and the terminal side. The other thing is, if you're going to write it in here, like then you either needed to rewrite this sine of negative pi over six. And a lot of students wrote like an x there or a theta, but they didn't define what x and theta were. So we're given the angle. So we don't want to write a theta or an x there. So we want to rewrite the angle. To simplify that, I'm just going to not write anything. I'm just going to put an equal sign and then write it there to kind of not take as long. Now, the important thing is we need to understand the reference angle. Um, that's one thing that I kind of worked on is, so the reference angle is of this tri of this angle is going to be pi over six. So what I like to do, the way that I evaluate using the unit circle is I find the reference angle. I didn't ask them to do this, but so this is just me teaching. Find the reference angle, find the sign for that reference angle. Whoa, sorry about that. Why did you do that? Stop. Don't know what's going on. That was weird. Okay. So I have pi over six. So you evaluate for the sign for the reference angle, which in this case is one half, but then you take into consideration which quadrant your point is in. Our point is in the fourth quadrant. Sine is negative. So therefore, this answer would have been a negative one half. Now let's go to the cosine of pi over four. Again, now we're going in the positive direction. So we're going this way. So again, Halfway around the circle is pi, or in our case, four pi over four. We're only going one of them, so you can break this up into four parts. That's a really bad half of a circle, but you can see that my angle here is right there. So it's in the first quadrant. The nice thing about being in the first quadrant is that the reference angle is the same as the given angle, so that's pi over four. I'm evaluating the cosine, which is the x coordinate. So there's really not much work I need to do here. That is just square root of two over two. That was my gimme question. All right, so for the cotangent, um, remember that's just the reciprocal of tangent. So if tangent of theta is y over x, then the cotangent theta is gonna be x over y. So let's go ahead and uh, graph this. So three pi over two. So again, if we know that halfway around a circle is pi or two pi over two, well, then pi halves is going to be half of that. And so that's pi halves, two pi halves. And then to get to three pi halves, we have to go right there. So that's coordinate point here. And you can see if this point is 0, 1, if we went down to the um, below the y-axis, that coordinate point would be 0, comma, negative 1. So again, this is your x and this is your y coordinates. So if tangent is y over x, cotangent is x over y, that's zero over negative one, which is just zero, right? So we can't divide by zero, um, that would be undefined, but zero is in the numerator in this case, so zero works out. And next one is secant of 13 pi over four. Forget about the secant for a second, let's just practice graphing this. So we know halfway around the circle is four pi, all the way around the circle is two pi, so that's going to be eight pi over four. So what I can do is break this up into eight pi over four plus five pi over four, right? So that means I need to go again 
all the way around. That would be 4 pi over 4. And then an extra pi over 4 would be down here. That would be my terminal side. So you needed to make sure that you showed that extra revolution. Because um, again, 4 pi over 4. And then all the way around again, here would be 16 pi over 4, right? So we broke this down into kind of four parts. And I just needed to go an extra pi over 4. So that's my corner point. Now let's go and take a look at the reference angle. Oh, it was important to understand we couldn't find a reference angle on this point. So there was no reference angle. That's why we had to use the point on the unit circle. And that's really why the unit circle is so helpful for us um, to do this because we could, for all of these, we can create a triangle and talk about our special right triangles. But when we're dealing with points that you know are on these axes, we can't use a triangle. So that's why we're going to be, um, <laughs> that's why the unit circle is so helpful for us on this. So here we go. We have theta prime is pi over 4. I don't know why I'm writing this in the unit circle or in the circle. So uh, we have the same coordinates. So we have theta prime is equal to pi over 4. And then if we look at our reference angle, we say pi over 4. Okay, but now it's in the third quadrant. And in the third quadrant, both points are negative, right? Both coordinates, x and y, are going to be negative. So if I'm dealing with the secant, which is the reciprocal of cosine. So let's just figure out what the cosine is of this real quick. So the cosine of 13 pi over 4 would be a negative square root of 2 over 2. So that means that the secant of 13 pi over 4 is going to be a negative 2 over the square root of 2. And when you go ahead and, oops, I'm sorry, let's put that equals to a negative. So now when you go ahead and rationalize the denominator here, what you're going to do is get a negative square root of 2. So when you simplify that, which I'm not going to do. Um, last one, tangent of 4 pi over 3. So let's just go ahead and graph this real quick. Again, halfway around a circle is 3 pi over 3. We need to go an extra third. So again, let's just break this up into three components. So 4 pi over 3 would be right there. Um, look at the reference angle from the terminal side to the x-axis, so we can say theta prime. So if we are at 3 pi over 3, we need to get, oops, I'm sorry, I'm going too fast. That's a negative, right? So let's redo that. That's very important. Okay, so let's do this again. It's in the negative direction. So we still have the same measurement. So that's still 3 pi over 3, but it's just in the negative direction, right? And then I'm going to go an extra third past that. So here's 3 pi over 3. I need to get to 4 pi over 3, so my angle will be right there. Now, the reference angle in this case is going to be from the x-axis to this terminal side. Again, I just went an extra pi over 3 over the x-axis. So we just say theta prime is equal to pi over 3. All right. Um, so now I look at my unit circle, and I look at the reference angle for pi over 3. That's one half. Oh, I'm sorry. The coordinate point here is 1 half comma square root of 3 over 2. However, it's in the second quadrant. So the coordinate point that I'm going to use is going to be a negative 1 half comma square root of 3 over 2. And this is very important for us to understand this because for tangent, remember that's y over x, right? So I'm going to um, have a negative 1 half here. So I can write the you know, tangent of negative 4 pi over 3 is equal to the square root of 3 over 2 divided by negative 1 half. And if you multiply by the circle on the top and bottom, you'll get the negative square root of 3. This is something we've done um, a lot in class, so I'm not going to kind of cover the arithmetic there because, again, this is a quiz. But hopefully you guys kind of get some ideas as far as what you can do to evaluate on the inner circle. So now we're finished with the... Uh, for your spots, and I'll go ahead and get on to the uh, multiple choice here in just a second, but I just wanted to take a little break. Um, so if you need a little stop, I'm just going to take a little break here before I get into the multiple choice and just kind of check in with you guys, um, see how you're doing, see Cowie Films. Could you provide the quadrant numbers? Uh, yes, I could. I'll kind of go back and I'll go back um, and add the quadrant numbers on there. Uh, have your juice says good, live from Mexico. Appreciate it. Awesome, man. Good to have you. Cyber Warriors, Ray. Uh, Aiden Tate says ln 1 over e equals ln of e to negative 1 equals negative 1. I'm assuming you're, I don't know what you're asking or just given an equation. Um, 
cool. Um, Wasabi Warriors, happy to be able to help you pass Algebra 2, man. Taught Algebra 2 for many years, so I'm glad my videos. Obviously, I know you guys don't get too much in-depth in trigonometry in the Algebra 2 curriculum, uh, depending on where you're taking it. Um, I know at least in the United States, we get into trigonometry now in Algebra 2 at the end of the year. So, um, But yeah, that's, that's kind of it. And you guys can hear my children are having a little bit of an issue. Um, having a hard time with everything. So uh, hopefully they'll break down and we'll have to maybe, that might limit as far as how much work I'm going to be able to get these done with that. So uh, Kitty Gamer MC, you're very helpful. Awesome, man. Glad uh, glad to help you there for you. Uh, Sierra Cooper, thank you for doing it the way you can understand. You are very, very welcome. I'm happy. Uh, a lot of what I'm doing here is uh, helping you out. Um, I have not covered any matrices, Mr. Yoke, so that is something hopefully I'll get into a little bit later. Um, and Brandon Pants, that is just a bad question. I, <laughs> I'm just joking. I don't want all those crazy questions to get through there. So, all right. Um, again, guys, I um, what I'll do is I'll just kind of run through these rather quickly. Obviously, my daughters are not enjoying that I'm going live right now, so um, I'll try to get through these as quickly as possible. And obviously, when I do the number five, I'll talk about the quadrant numbers for you. Um, and so I'm just going to kind of run through this. If you guys have any quick questions, I'll be happy to see if I can answer them rather quickly. All right. So let's go ahead and get into this one on this quadrant. Just a quick little refresher in identifying our quadrants here. We have quadrant one, quadrant two, quadrant three, and quadrant four. The way that we kind of understand them, if you look at the coordinate points, you know, x, y, then this one's negative x, comma, negative y. Uh, this would be negative x, negative y. And this one would be x, comma, negative y. All right. So remember that what we talked about, cosecant and, and sine are the exact same. Like remember, if sine is y, sine of theta is y, then cosecant is one over y. So it doesn't matter if you have you know a y or one over y. If it's positive, it's positive. If it's one over y and it's positive, then it's still. Or if it's if y is positive, it doesn't. It's still going to be positive no matter what. So this is the same as sine of theta is greater than zero, and this is the same as cosine of theta is greater than zero, right? Because the reciprocals, if one's positive, then they're both going to be positive. So sine of theta is greater than zero. Well, that's only going to be true, which I wrote that wrong. That is only going to be true above the x coordinate, right? Because, or above the x axis, I'm sorry, because you can see sine is representative of y. You can see it's positive in the first and the second quadrant. So, so far I have these two. Oops, let's do it in a, another color. And then I'm looking at cosecant of theta. Well, that's only going to be positive in the a cosine sine of theta. And then cosine is only going to be positive in the um, in the first or in the second, right? Because you can see that x has to be positive, and that's only going to be positive in the first or second. So you can see that our winner is quadrant one, which is answer D. The next one is sine of theta equals negative seven, square root of negative seven, or Negative square root of seven over four and cosine of theta equals three over four. Find the cotangent. Again, we gotta be careful with this negative. Now again, that's not going to apply to the four because the four represents the hypotenuse, right? Sine is opposite over hypotenuse. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. So let's just go ahead and draw a triangle here. Cosine's positive, sine is negative. It doesn't really matter what you, um, how you how you draw the triangle, but I know that that, quad, that would be in the, um, fourth quadrant if I was going to be doing that one, and that would be four. So again, here would be my angle. So again, you can check cosine three over four, sine negative square root of seven four, but you don't really need to know this information. Um, you could just understand that cotangent is going to be adjacent over opposite. So that would be, um, so I can say cotangent of theta is three over negative seven. And then when I rationalize the denominator, I get negative three over seven over seven, which is answer D. Um, so again, this would be understanding this on the quadrant axis because that negative tells us that it's, you know, direction matters. 
For number seven, which of the following angles is coterminal with negative 245? So previously on the uh, on the front side, we talked about adding plus or minus two pi. Um, in degree form, that's the same thing as adding and subtracting uh, 360. So if I add 360 here, you can basically just say you know 360 minus 245, which is really the same thing, and we're get, gonna get 115 degrees. Got two more questions. Two more questions. Um, and obviously that one works, right? So I don't really, I mean, if I add 360 again to that, to get another one, I'd get 475, which is not a angle, you know, that's not even an answer choice. So as long as I just double check my work here, I can see that I'm good. The answer again is D. Uh, for number eight, if uh, theta is an angle in standard position whose terminal side passes through the point negative five, three, then the value of sine of theta is. So this one's very, very important. Um, again, we didn't talk about a point on the first side, but so that's why I had to choose this one. So if we're at a coordinate point, points, negative five, two, three, four, five, one, two, three. So we have negative five and we went up three, right? So there's your coordinate point negative five three but we can draw a triangle with a with our central angle which is very important which we talked about in class central angle at the origin and then we have a right triangle so rather than writing the three there i'm just going to write the three here so we can see here we have the um, opposite as well as the adjacent side of the triangle well to figure out sine i need to figure out the hypotenuse so i'll just do a three squared plus a negative five squared equals i'm going to call this r because that's what we talked about so that would be 9 plus 25 equals r squared. Therefore, we have 34 equals r squared. So r is equal to the square root of 34. Well, obviously, any answer that has a square root of 34, since we can't simplify it, you can see the answer is e. But again, let's just go and take a look at that. That sign of that would be opposite over that. So it would be 3 over the square root of 34. And you can see that, that when you rationalize the denominator, you get answer e. All right, last one is intersects a unit circle. Okay, so let theta be an angle in standard position. The terminal side of, of theta intersects a unit circle at negative two fifths, negative two fifths comma square root of 21 over five. Now this isn't a point that we've talked about on the unit circle, but it's important that since we know it's a point on the unit circle, and this is something I added in um, on there. I don't know why I didn't get in the quiz, so I added to my students, so I'm not just like making it up. But since we know this is a point on the unit circle, we know that like we can represent those as x and y points on the inner circle. And what's important about that is when we're evaluating the cotangent of an angle for a point on the inner circle, we just know that it's going to be the ratio of x over y. So all we needed to do in this case is just take negative 2 over 5 and divide it by the square root of 21 over 5. Now, if you don't know how to simplify this, you can uh, multiply by the reciprocal on the top and bottom, which I guess I'll just show here. Um, there are some simpler ways to like do this. All right, but when you multiply by the reciprocal and denominator, that obviously go to makes the denominator over here one. Here, the fives divide out, and you're left with a negative two over the square root of 21. We don't need to write this over one anymore, so you can just write this as negative two over the square root of 21. And then you can rationalize the denominator to get negative two. Oh, well, again, you don't need to rationalize the denominator because you can see the answer is D right there. Um, so, yeah, and obviously once you do more and more of these, you guys will see that this, uh, um, that gets quicker and quicker. You don't need to show your work. So, um, Corey says, is this on the ACT? I'm not really sure, actually. I don't believe trigonometry is. Maybe some basic trig is on the SAT, but I don't know. SAT, ACT prep is not really something that I cover. I have taught a class where we did some of that stuff, um, but it's just not something that I focus on, you know, from me. So, um, okay. What class is this for? This is for pre-calculus. That is the class that I'm learning uh, this for. So Blake says negative x, y. Yeah, I think I made, um, I think I fixed that though, right? Quadrant two? Yeah, negative x, y, so I fixed that. Thank you for checking me on me though because I was going a little bit fast. Um, and that's what happens when you go a little bit fast. You start making you know, some mistakes. 
So, wow, that's a lot of REITs. Okay, so I'm glad I checked in with you guys. So, all right, guys. Well, um, I'm just going to make this kind of quick here. Um, I will be going live, uh, I believe, two more times this week. So, you know, again, if you guys would like to um, see the next time I'm going to go live, just feel make sure to do subscribe, you know, get the notification. Um, I will try to schedule my live streams as best I can. As of this point, I'm not sure exactly when I'll be doing it, but if I am able to, you know, organize that, I will go ahead and get that for you guys. But yeah, we'll be covering this week, we're going to be covering graphing um, the trigonometric functions as well as graphing the reciprocal trigonometric functions. So that's where we're going to cover these live streams. Um, if you are interested in any of this, you know, work or stuff like that, um, then that you know you like to see these worksheets that I'm providing to my students. The let's see, we're doing homework, quizzes, tests, um, as well as all the answers to kind of help you out in your own classes. Um, I am getting the you know that is something that I provide to the, like the YouTube memberships. If you haven't checked it out, uh, feel free just to kind of see if it's something that you're interested in. Obviously, it's really only geared towards uh, pre-calculus students. It's not geared to you know algebra or calculus. However. For Algebra 2 and Calculus, there are a lot of topics that we cover in pre-calculus um, that I will definitely help you for your classes. So I'm providing uh, new worksheets every single week. And so if that's something that you're interested in, you kind of like the in, you know instruction, but you also want to kind of see um, or you want to have something that's tangible, some documents that you can print out or work on, um, then that might be something you'd be interested in. So feel free to check it out or, you know, send me a message. I'll be more than happy to, you know, kind of let you know. But it's basically as I make things for my class, um, I provide it on into the YouTube channels um, as well. And um, obviously, if you'd like a... Um, a detailed version of the videos that I provide that I don't post on YouTube. Um, I post those on Patreon as well. So if that's something that you're interested in, kind of see if that's something you need a little bit more help, um, then that's awesome. However, guys, those are kind of paid features. So, you know, please don't understand. I don't want to direct anybody to there if that's not something you're interested in. If you can find what you're looking for on YouTube and and everything that I'm doing for these live streams work for you, then I am happy to continue doing this for you. So hope you guys have a great rest of your Sunday. I am going to uh, end this stream and then get on with taking care of my kiddos.